And on behalf of CNA, we would like to welcome you all to this inclusive national security event. We've hosted some fascinating events over the past few years, focused on everything from wargaming to the experience of transgender service members to bias and in artificial intelligence. We are pleased to be hosting our second event of this year, Climate Conflicts and Environmental Peacebuilding, Intersectional Approaches, featuring Dr. Erica Weinthal and Dr. Aubrey Pence. As a bit of context for those new to the series, the purpose of the Inclusive National Security Initiative is to develop a forum for discussion and promote a community of national security professionals who are interested in exploring the implications of structural biases in their fields. You can find recordings of our 2021 and 2022 series, which explored racism and national security and gender and national security respectively on our website, which we will now post a link to in the chat box. Our theme for this year is intersectionality and national security. For those new to the series or this term, intersectionality is a social and analytical framework that takes into account an individual's overlapping identities, including gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, sexual orientation, religion, disability, and class, in order to understand the unique prejudices and experiences they may face. An intersectional approach can add nuance to how we think about national security challenges and provide a lens for potential solutions. Before we start, a quick note on Zoom etiquette, a reminder that this event will be recorded and your microphones will be muted. If at any time you have questions for our speakers, please submit them through the chat box function to the person named Q&A. We'll collect questions throughout the event and pass them over to our uh, expert discussant and speaker. And on that note, I'd like to introduce our discussant today, Dr. Aubrey Paris. Uh, Dr. Paris is the Senior Policy Advisor on Gender, Climate Change, and Innovation in the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the U.S. Department of State, where she leads foreign policy and public diplomacy efforts related to the nexus of gender and climate change. During her time at the State Department, Dr. Paris has launched the Innovation Station Initiative, to amplify the impact of women and girls innovators developing translatable solutions to climate related challenges while simultaneously drawing subnational con connections between domestic and international communities. Prior to joining the State Department, Dr. Paris was a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow and energy and climate scholar at Princeton University. During her graduate studies, she continued to research projects on the transformation of carbon dioxide into marketable products, water scarcity implications of coal-fired power plants, the future of U.S. nuclear energy, and climate change impacts on national security. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Paris to introduce our keynote speaker and kick off the conversation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really pleased to be here with our guest speaker um, and very pleased to be able to welcome everyone to this session. Um, it is my distinct honor to introduce our guest speaker for today's event. That is Dr. Erica Weinthal. Dr. Weinthal is a professor of environmental policy and public policy at Duke University. She specializes in global environmental politics and environmental security with a particular emphasis on water and energy. Her current areas of research include global environmental politics and governance, environmental conflict and peace building, the political economy of the resource curse, and climate change adaptation. Dr. Weinthal is the author of the award-winning book, State Making and Environmental Cooperation, Linking Domestic Politics and International Politics in Central Asia, and a co-author of Oil is Not a Curse. She was a member of the UN Environment Program Expert Group on Conflict and Peacebuilding. She's a founding member of the Environmental Peacebuilding Association and currently serves as a vice president. She's also an associate editor for the association's recently launched journal, Environment and Security. We're very excited to welcome you to the stage today and hear your insights, Dr. Weinthal. Uh, today's event, Climate Conflicts and Environmental Peacebuilding, will explore the complexities of conflicts exacerbated by climate change and the disproportionate impacts of climate change across various groups, with a particular focus on water scarcity and water-based conflicts. 
So following Dr. Weinthal's remarks, I'll share a few brief remarks of my own, and then we will transition into a discussion, including questions from the audience, so start taking notes of what questions you have. But for now, Dr. Weinthal, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Dr. Paris. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be able to share the screen, the floor with you um, during this event. I also want to start by thanking the um, DNA um, Inclusive Security Team for inviting me. So I believe I need to share my screen and we'll do that. Um, and let me... Let me get this, oops, um, sorry, not letting me. Which one am I clicking? Oh, here it is on the bottom, sorry about that. I couldn't see it for a second. Okay, um, so I was given a very big <laughs> um, topic to cover. Um, and inserted a comma between climate and conflicts largely because there's a lot of interse intersectionality just in the themes that I am covering today, um, trying to understand the relationship between climate and conflict and environmental peace building and what it means for different constituencies, different people, different stakeholders. And so this is going to be a very high level overview that hopefully will um, allow us to engage in a conversation. So I want to start um, by just providing some context to what is this field I am talking about. Um, because when we talk about environmental peace building, it means different things for different people. And it also is a relatively new field in many ways and has its origins in earlier discussions surrounding environmental security. Um, and I wanna note too, like the field of environmental security that emerged in the 1990s, in many ways was about making national security more inclusive and addressing gaps in what um, those who were working in the environmental space saw within the conventional national security field at that time, largely because there had the national security studies, um, international security had really marginalized those that were thinking about questions related to the environment, demography, human security, um, and climate change for that matter. And so this, the creation of the field of environmental security in the 1990s was a response to the end of the Cold War and a way to expand the range of topics that really um, fed into our understanding, a broader understanding of security. From there emerged what I would say is the field of environmental peace building, which also compromises, um, comprises different approaches and pathways by which the environment is integrated into the broader field of peace building and security, looking at everything from how the environment plays a role in conflict prevention, mitigation, resolution, and post-conflict peace building or recovery. And here, you know, we can parse many topics, including you know, how natural resources finance conflict to climate resilience. Um, and now we're really at what would be the next wave of environmental peace building, which I think fits even nicer with this notion of inclusive national security, because we're really looking at bottom up approaches, looking at the role of communities in the peace building process, um, looking at the role of gender, looking at conflict sensitive, co conflict sensitive programming, and also the role of monitoring and evaluation, which again takes into um, the perspectives and participation of different stakeholders. So just gonna flag this report, which really was foundational to the creation of the environmental peace building field, which was the first time where um, scholars and practitioners were trying to understand the relationship between the environment and conflict, trying to understand the role that natural resources played 
And this is a report that's now already, you know, more than a decade old, but it was the first time that really showed a link between natural resources, internal conflicts, um, highlighting and demonstrating that a large number of civil wars had a link to natural resources. So trying to understand the role of livelihoods um, and the environment and natural resources in fueling conflict, but also looking at what happens at the end of conflict, because often peace building agreements are negotiated between different combatants or um, governments, but often leave out those that are most affected by war and also the natural resource sector, which has played an increasing role, increasingly large role in different conflicts. Climate security has been um, central to our understanding of the relationship between the environment, natural resources, um, conflict and peace building. It takes on different roles depending where, um, you know, the particular context, the, um, you know, many people will focus on, you know, pictures of polar bears have been a way that has captivated the international community. But when we're really talking about human security and those most affected by climate change, we're starting to, you know, we're talking about droughts, we're talking about floods, we're talking about fires, but we're talking even more about the agricultural sector and people not having access to, um, staples that are necessary for their diet just by looking at the you know the the war in Ukraine right now and how that has disrupted global food supply chains. The UN began only you could say in the 2000s to really think about climate change as a security issue and start talking about the security implications. Um, and here when we in in this realm it was looking at the impacts or threats to the well-being of the most vulnerable populations, because different populations are affected differently by climate change. And you know, often it is the most vulnerable communities who are the least able to adapt. And this can be every, you know, women, children, the elderly um, that may not have um, the resources to adapt. Um, the World Economic Forum has also focused on, you know. The role of climate change in, you know, increasingly as a threat to the world economy. And this has been really interesting to look at over time, because if you were to go back into the early, you know, the early 2000s, the greatest threats um, to the world economy um, were more focused on economic issues. But in the last few years, you can see how green everything is, or and also societal issues. So water crises are very high on the agenda. Um, and you know, this is from 2022. You can see the what is seen as the most severe risk, um, climate action failure, extreme weather, biodiversity loss, livelihood crises, infectious disease. And so these are the issues that are really about human security, about people, putting people first when we think about national security. So I've been working recently um, on a paper that's gonna come out with the United States Institute of Peace, um, looking at this relationship between climate change, um, migration and urban environments. And so when we're talking about inclusive, you know, inclusive national security and issues related to climate change, often in this space, we're talking about the people who are moving, who are on the move, who are being forced to move because of climate change impacts. And looking at the way also that armed conflict and the climate crisis interact in complex and reinforcing ways that undermine human security. And so um, in this paper, we look at three cases, Honduras, Jordan, and Pakistan, to try to map out different pathways, um, trying to understand the drivers of, conf you know, of migration. Um, whether it's conflict or climate or the interaction, but also then the impacts on migrants themselves who are often the most vulnerable and also have um, complex identities um, and multiple identities um, as they interact with other populations and forced to migrate um, both internally and across borders. Um, but I wanna note too that 
migration is something that no one ever seeks to, um, to migrate. Um, you know, it's especially when in armed conflict or, you know, conflict affected migration, it is often seen as a last resort. Um, it is, you know, the worst case of adap adaptation to climate change and or to, you know, armed conflict. So, you know, Honduras, you know, you can look at cases, this is a case where you've had, um, you know, intensifying droughts and hurricanes that affected the agricultural sector that have forced people to move internally, but then people face, um, you know, have faced violence internally in cities and have, you know, chosen or been forced to migrate across international borders. Jordan, I'll talk a little bit more in a second. Pakistan, another case of floods and the impacts on peri-urban environments. I also want to uh, highlight Libya because this is a co country that's also been affected by climate, I mean, by conflict for you know over a decade, but also is very vulnerable to climate change given it, the level of water scarcity there, but has been become a transit country too for human trafficking. Um, you know, in our paper, we look at the different stresses on the urban environments, on infrastructure, but also on migrants, the physical and mental health tolls that people face, um, you know, from having to leave their home and um, uproot themselves and the violence they may face um, as they move into new um, environments and contexts. You know, Jordan, I just want to say a few words here and happy to talk more in detail about particular conflicts. But this is really where we're seeing an intersection of conflict and climate change and impacts on different populations. Jordan is one of the most water scarce countries in the world. Um, it is heavily affected by droughts, protracted droughts over the last few years. It has had to turn to very um, in heavy, um, you know, in, um, centralized infrastructure projects to transfer water, but it's also home to the second highest number of refugees in the world. And it's not just because of the recent war in Syria, but it is, it, Jordan has absorbed over time refugees from Iraq, from Yemen, from Palestine. And this has um, put increasing pressure on its water resources. Um, you see, you know, social services being overburdened. Um, many of the cities don't receive water 24 seven. And this has affects women, it affects children, it affects, you know, refugees internally displaced, um, people who have had to move across the border. Um, and it's created competition too between local communities and those that have been displaced by conflict. Um, you know, this is just um, extracted from a, a United Nations Environment Program report to try to show the multiple dimensions by which water scarcity or water in particular can play a role in um, exacerbated conflict, but also providing opportunities for peace building. And, um, you know, increasingly the reason, you know, when we talk about those that are most affected by um, conflict, you know, often it is the impacts on basic services, especially for refugee populations, for internally displaced peoples, for many that are left behind, often the elderly, the disabled, um, women with small children, because conflict in many of the recent wars in the Middle East and now in Ukraine has taken a heavy toll on infrastructure. We have seen the decimation destruction of critical um, water infrastructure um, and also um, the lack of human capital to continue for the inf for infrastructure to function. I wanna highlight some of the other work I've been doing just to give a, a bigger perspective on how we think about different stakeholders and the importance of inclusivity when we're talking about post-conflict peace building. And this is another project that I was involved with um, that comes that's tied to the Environmental Peace Building Association, um, where we carried out a number of case studies by different authors. And one case I would love I want to highlight, which I think is really important, is from um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, because this case really showed the importance of including women in the decision-making process at the end of conflict, especially when 
refugee populations were moving back to the um, to the Kivus, to South Kivu, and having to recreate um, water management um, structures and programs. And Tier Fund, as an organization, really focused on um, bringing women into leadership roles because what they learned was they understood the importance of clean water and working with other communities to come together to um, address, um, you know, the provision of clean water, whereas others might have said we, you know, highlight a different, um, you know, irrigation, for example, rather than this emphasis on water is necessary for basic services. And then just a few more slides to conclude. Um, USAID um, recently published an update to its water and conflict um, toolkit. And here too, there has been greater attention, this understanding that we have to move away from just thinking about water as an entry point for bringing about peace building. But if you really want to have a more inclusive or positive peace, one needs to really emphasize um, more participation, of women, marginalized groups, having the perspectives of multiple stakeholders in the programming, having it be much more inclusive, context specific um, in coming up with um, various programming everywhere from you know, humanitarian interventions to development programming. Um, we're seeing this too you know, with the sustainable development goals, thinking about the intersectionality among the, the goals that if you want to attain the um, expanding universal access to clean water and sanitation, you also have to think about how that relates to gender equality and other issues. And then lastly, I wanna just conclude with um, a slide to highlight you know, a few areas, one where I work with the Environmental Peace Building Association and how we've been thinking about um, you know, expanding, um, you know, more inclusive um, peace build, environmental peace building um, through interest groups that are tied to the association, such as the, the gender interest group, but also um, to highlight what I think is where some of this really interesting work is taking place right now. I was at the UN Water Conference and was able to attend an event by the Women in Water Diplomacy Network, which is really talking about why it's important to have women at the negotiating table, both at the transboundary level, but also at the very local level, as in the case that I was highlighting from the Democratic Republic of Congo. So I am going to stop there um, and stop my share. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Weinthal, for those insights and your experiences. I'm really eager to get into the Q&A portion of this discussion. And with that in mind, I do want to remind participants to please continue sending your questions through the chat box to the host who is labeled Q&A. All right, so um, please continue sending those in. And as we give you some time to do so, I did wanna share um, some thoughts from, from my perch, my policymaking perspective. Um, and I really have to say that some of those tangible examples and case studies that Dr. Weinthal provided, I think are gonna be really crucial for our, our collective understanding of this issue in this conversation today. So as Analia mentioned, earlier in this discussion, I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Gender, Climate Change, and Innovation in the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the U.S. Department of State. So I think it's fair to say that whenever I'm coming at this conversation of intersectionality, I am always looking at it from the gendered perspective plus. So how are different topics such as climate change and climate crises, conflict, etc., how are those topics affecting women and how are those impacts changing based on the various identity factors of those women, the different um, identities that they have that are always cross-cutting. Um, and for those reasons, I, I really think that the climate crisis is considered a cross-cutting issue in our office, the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues. It really does influence just about every one of our gender-specific policy priorities, including women, peace and security, women's economic security, and preventing and responding to gender-based violence. And there are further intersectional dimensions to each of these topics as well. So 
Women's leadership in climate related decision making is really critical at all levels from local to national to international and in all sectors. So that means from government to industry to grassroots organizations and more. And as you may know, or as you may have gleaned or inferred from Dr. Reinthal's uh, presentation, evidence really does increasingly demonstrate that empowering women politically, economically, and socially, and meaningfully including their needs and perspectives in decision making really does lead to more equitable and sustainable policies, including those to combat the climate crisis and different challenges that it poses. At the government level, research shows that when women, um, when more women are in positions of leadership, environmental agreements are more likely to be ratified, land use policies are more likely to be reformed, and the environment is more likely to be protected. That all has very important intersections for this conversation regarding conflict and peace building. And then at the community level, women and girls are already leaders in so many relevant initiatives related to climate mitigation, ranging from um, adopting sustainable agricultural practices to planting trees, etc. But I think it's important to recognize that realizing this leadership potential also involves um, realizing the disproportionate effects of climate change that are experienced by women and girls all around the world. Now, many of these effects are directly tied to an increased risk of displacement, migration, and conflict, as was so astutely pointed out. And this is especially true in regions that already suffer from instability. Now, these outcomes may be triggered by extreme weather events or natural disasters, states of too much water or not enough water, but they can also be induced by food insecurity or degradation of other natural resources. Now, as you may all know, women and girls are more likely to be responsible for procuring these sorts of natural resources, food, water, firewood, whether for sustenance or for livelihood purposes. And as scarcity increases, these traditional roles and responsibilities come with an increased risk of encountering gender-based violence, whether out in the world, in the home, on migration or collection routes, or in temporary shelters put in place following natural disasters. And as natural resource availability dwindles, families also feel pressure to reduce their expenses, and we see child early and forced marriages increase as well, just to add more complexity to this already very complex topic. But despite these challenges, we also see that, that women and girls are truly poised to turn climate challenges e into economic opportunities for themselves and for their families, all while having a positive impact on their environment. Of course, ensuring that these opportunities come to fruition requires that women and girls have access to the education, training, mentorship, and financing to work or lead in these entrepreneurial contexts or these social change contexts. And we have to be proactive about ensuring women and girls participation and leadership in these areas and really in all sectors undergoing transitions to more sustainable practices because they face myriad institutional structural or cultural barriers to their inclusion. Um, for instance, some countries restrict women from working in certain sectors. Others fail to grant women the right to own land. And in many developed nations, less formal, more systemic barriers exist, which may contribute to the reason why women comprise only 32% of the renewable energy sector. That's a newer sector where gender roles and expectations should theoretically be far less entrenched, right? Now, some may see this as a challenge, but I think it's equally important to see it as an opportunity to help women achieve security, uh, whether that be security in a, in a social context or in an economic context, um, while in many cases helping them to facilitate climate change mitigation or adaptation. And that's why, from the U.S. government's perspective, we've adopted a two-pronged approach to guide policy programming and outreach efforts related to the gender climate nexus. On the one hand, we recognize the importance of addressing these disproportionate impacts of climate change on women, girls, and marginalized communities. And on the other hand, we must recognize that due to their relationship with their families, communities, and environment, women and girls are poised to develop effective and locally relevant solutions to climate challenges, and they must be empowered to do so. This includes in negotiation, peacekeeping, and decision-making settings related to natural resource management, forums where decisions are being made regarding how to prevent, respond to, and recover from climate-related conflict. Now, this is more than just a sentiment. 
It is a strategic priority outlined at the highest levels of U.S. policy in our national strategy on gender equity and equality. It's also been integrated into the 2022 U.S. Strategy on Preventing and Responding to Gender-Based Violence Globally and the 2023 U.S. Strategy on Global Women's Economic Security. So as I wrap up my remarks here and begin to transition into Q&A, um, I did want to share some best practices that I believe we've witnessed regarding how to ensure that women and girls' perspectives are included in climate decision making, as well as how to ensure women and girls can seize opportunities to lead in climate action. First and foremost, it is really critical to ensure that efforts related to gender equity and equality and climate action are integrated. So get rid of the silos that they typically exist within, because there is such important interconnectedness between these themes. Secondly, women, girls, and marginalized communities should be integrated into decision making programs or other efforts related to climate adaptation and mitigation at the earliest stages of project development to ensure that their unique perspectives are meaningfully integrated and not just turning this into a box checking exercise. Third, women, girls, and marginalized communities should be directly consulted to identify barriers to their participation and leadership in climate action arenas. This can subsequently guide collaborative action with these groups to overcome the identified challenges. Fourth, we must recognize how intersectional identities and demographic factors can increase the burden of climate impacts while also offering critical perspectives that truly cannot be left out of decision making and programming. Our action here will not, we're not going to find a silver bullet, right? We need to recognize how different factors such as, um, but not limited to, race, ethnicity, indigenous status, disability status, LGBTQI plus status, rural versus urban location, et cetera, how all of those factors go into one's experience of climate related factors. And fifth slash finally, we have personally found quite a bit of utility in building networks of women and girls across countries, regions, or globally to share their best practices and translate locally effective solutions to new locations, really recognizing that geographically distant communities may face similar climate challenges and therefore could have a lot to learn from one another. <laughs> 